American Scourge, Active Shooters and Mass Killings in the United States. I will begin this presentation with a short introduction. Next, I will move on to the literature review, which covers four topics. After the literature review, I will move on to cover my research, which covers four active killer events in the United States between the years 2016 and 2023. Finally, I will go over the discussion, limitations, and conclusion of this presentation. Not many events evoke as much emotion and media coverage as an active shooter or a mass killing event. These events happen all over the world, but America suffers these events more than any other country. This is not a new um, phenomenon, but the number of these events and the lethality of these events have increased drastically in recent years. Active shooter events can happen anywhere at any time, and there is not an exact profile as to who will perpetrate one of these crimes. Perpetrators have been bullied students, employees, or patrons who feel they've been wronged in some way, foreign or domestic terrorists, jilted or scorned lovers, people with mental illness, and more. There have been active shooters in malls, schools, hospitals, on government property, places of worship, open areas, and many, many others. These events take away our sense of security and lead to societal anxiety that is very difficult to overcome. Some of the most lethal, lethal active killer events in our nation's history have occurred in the last decade. Technology has made modern weaponry more lethal than ever before. These advances, as well as target locations chosen by the perpetrators, have increased the lethality of the events in recent years. A major factor in the increased lethality is the response by law enforcement. Law enforcement has had to change their tactics as this threat has continued to spread throughout the nation. Uh, historically, law enforcement would respond to the scene, secure a perimeter, and call for a tactical unit to come in and address the threat. This has proven to be the wrong way to address active killer events. The combination of time, ammunition, and available targets is what leads to large mass killing events. Police don't have control over the amount of ammunition the killer has or the number of targets at the scene, but they do have control over the amount of time the killer has to inflict uh, casualties. Nearly all law enforcement agencies have amended their policies on the response to active shooters. Uh, in an effort to save lives. The current standard for responding to these incidents is to engage the killer as soon as the first officer arrives on scene with whatever manpower is available uh, to end the threat. In May of 2021, the Federal Bureau of Investigation released a 20-year review of active shooter events from 2000 to 2019. According to their statistics, there were 333 active shooter incidents between those years that resulted in 2,851 casualties in 43 states in the District of Columbia. Of these 333 events, 135 of them were classified as mass killings, meaning that there were three or more fatalities. The fatalities consisted of civilians, law enforcement officers, and security guards. The number of people injured in these events was even higher. There were 1,703 civilians wounded, 80 law enforcement officers wounded, and six security guards wounded. During this time frame, there were 345 total shooters. 332 were male and 13 were female. 119 of the shooters committed suicide. 34% of the male shooters committed suicide compared to 46% of the female shooters. 150 shooters were apprehended by law enforcement, 67 were killed by law enforcement, four were killed by civilians, and five were never apprehended. These statistics show that most of the shooters were male during the time frame studied, but the suicide rate of female killers was higher. The United States averaged 16.65 active shooter events per year during this time frame. The number of events varied dramatically throughout the years reviewed. 2000 saw the lowest number of active shooter events with three. 2017 had the highest number with 31, while 2018 and 2019 had 30 events each. 
The number of fatalities during the years studied by the FBI varied dramatically. The average number of casualties per year was 55.05. 2000 saw the lowest number of fatalities was 16, while 2017 had the highest number with 143. One reason 2017 had so many fatalities is because the deadliest active shooter event in U.S. history occurred in October of that year. 58 people were killed in that event alone. The locations of these attacks also vary greatly. 96 active killer events took place in businesses that were open to pedestrian traffic. These businesses included restaurants, bars, theaters, grocery stores, event venues, and others. There were 62 attacks at schools, 44 at pre-K to 12th grade, and 18 at colleges. 21 attacks occurred on government properties and 9 took place on military properties. 15 attacks occurred at healthcare facilities. Additionally, there were 15 attacks in places of worship, 10 at malls, and 13 attacks at private residences. One postulation as to why there are so many active shooter events in America is because of Americans' access to weapons. Another possible reason for the high lethality rate of these events is because shooters are using assault rifles in the commission of their crimes. The FBI's 20-year review shows that handguns were actually the weapon of choice for most of these shooters. Handguns accounted for 67% of the weapons used in these events. Some of the shooters, 38%, had multiple weapons during the shootings. In total, there were 344 handguns, 144 rifles, and 58 shotguns used in active shooter events from 2000 to 2019. It is impossible to come up with a single profile for an active killer. The histories of these individuals vary greatly. However, there are some traits that many active shooter suspects share. 42% of active killers were subjected to trauma and violence at a young age. Childhood trauma has a dramatic impact on the lives of those who have been exposed to it. This trauma can cause the individual to face many problems as adults. Some of these problems are relationship problems, mental health issues, and alcohol and drug dependency. 58% of attackers from 2016 to 2020 showed symptoms of mental health issues prior to or at the time of their attacks. Of the perpetrators who showed symptoms of mental illness, 25% had depression, bipolar disorder, or some other mood disorder, and another 27% had some kind of psychotic symptoms. These numbers show that mental illness could have been a factor in some of these active killer events. With that said, just under 40% of the attackers showed no evidence of mental illness prior to their attack. 80% of active shooters were in some kind of crisis before they initiated their crimes. In the days, weeks, or months leading up to the events, people who knew the shooters said they were concerned by the person's behavior. Some of the behaviors observed were extreme emotional responses, fascination with violence, and or indications of hopelessness. 72% of perpetrators were suicidal at the time of their events. The Department of Homeland Security reported lower numbers of suicidality in their report on attacks from 2016 to 2020. According to that report, around 25% of the attackers had suicidal thoughts prior to their attacks. There are three common components um, to shooters' motivations. The most common issues were grievances, ideological, bias-related, or political beliefs, and psychotic symptoms. Grievances was a motivator for approximately half of the active shooter attacks from 2016 to 2020. Most of these grievances were personal and included bullying, stress related to health and finances, feuds, or feelings of victimization. Other grievances included domestic situations or work workplace problems. 18% of the attacks were motivated by extremism or hate between 2016 and 2020. Race, ethnicity, religion, national origin, gender or gender identity, sexual orientation, and beliefs were all factors for attacks. Attackers held grievances that were extremely personal to them, and these grievances were the primary, fact, primary motivator for the attack. 
Of the attackers who are motivated by extremism or hate, 26% held conspiratorial, uh, topic-specific, or hateful beliefs. During this time frame, 14% of the attacks were carried out by people who had symptoms of psychosis. These symptoms included hallucinations, beliefs of spirit possession, and others. Other attackers just had a desire to kill. One attacker during this time told people prior to the attack that he wanted to be an active shooter who killed more than anyone in the past. 32% of the attackers were employed at the time of their attack, while 21 were unemployed. The attackers who were employed ranged in occupation from food service to software developer to active military members. 29% of the attackers had lost their jobs either by quitting or by being fired at least once prior to their attacks. The attacker's criminal history was somewhat significant. 64% had prior criminal history. 38% of the attackers had previous arrests for violent offenses. Offenses some of the attackers were arrested for were domestic violence, assault, robbery, animal cruelty, sex offenses, drug-related crimes, weapons offenses, public intoxication, harassment, tampering with witnesses, and more. Over 60% of the attackers had a criminal record. However, many were not prohibited from owning or buying firearms. 68.9% were legal gun owners and 75.6% legally purchased firearms before their attack. Some attackers were contacted by law enforcement, but for various reasons were not charged or arrested. 31% of attackers were contacted by the police, but no arrests were made. The reasons for the law enforcement contacts can provide some insight into the attacker's state of mind or circumstances leading up to the attacks. Some reasons for police contact included reports of concerning behavior, being served protection orders or eviction orders, standing by while the attacker was terminated from a job or while a cohabitant retrieved items from a residence, conducting welfare checks, or transporting for mental health evaluations. 29% of the attackers were identified as withdrawn or antisocial. Of these perpetrators, some were noticeably uncomfortable in social settings. Others actively avoided people and took part in aggressive behavior. Over one third of the perpetrators between 2016 and 2020 had a history of willful malicious conduct towards others. This behavior was directed towards people in schools, their places of employment, neighborhoods, and homes. 93% of the offenders had a significant stressor within five years of the attack, and 77 of these had stressors that occurred within one year of the attack. The majority of these stressors were either family-related or personal issues. 30% of the offenders were married at the time of the attack. It was found that having a stable, intimate partner may have actually served as a protective factor against perpetrating an attack. Other stressors prior to the attack included contact with civil courts, employment issues, social interactions, health problems, police contacts, and education. The Department of Homeland Security identified eight types of behavioral changes that occurred in the attackers within five years of their attacks. These changes are mental well-being, and mood, general behavior, uncharacteristic actions, appearance, work or school related, religion or beliefs, substance abuse, and positive change. Some kind of behavioral change or changes in these categories were seen in 38% of perpetrators within five years of the attacks. Mental health, well-being, and mood was the most commonly observed behavioral change in the offenders who attacked between 2016 and 2020. Withdrawal from family and or friends was the most noticeable change during this time. The offender became less social and stopped interacting with friends and family in the time leading up to the attack. Other factors involved behavioral change, including signs of depression, an increased level of anger, aggression, violent and threatening behavior, increased paranoia and delusional thinking, and declining overall mental health to include anxiety, dark moods, and emotional erraticism. Other than normal, behavior um, was also observed. These included an increase or decrease in sleep, a change in eating patterns, more secretive, more argumentative, bitterness, and a loss of affection. 
The Department of Homeland Security found these general behavior changes and also included when the offender became unhinged, became increasingly disturbed or irrational, and acted strange, crazy, or otherwise different from their normal behavior. Uncharacteristic actions were actions that were previously out of character for the offender. These changes included not paying bills, giving away belongings, ending relationships, and carrying weapons. The appearance category included the offender's clothing as well as their personal physical appearance. Poor hygiene, changing hair color, growing beards, shaving heads, gaining or losing weight, and appearing unkept are some of the changes seen in the offenders prior to attack. When a change manifested in the attacker's performance at work or school, it included attendance, quitting, leaving early, or starting uh, to make errors that have occurred in the past. The offender became more vocal about religion or social and political beliefs. Communications filled with hate, reading and participating in radical propaganda, and becoming more religious than usual. An increased use of drugs or alcohol was also um, a behavior that was observed. The positive changes category is the most counterintuitive of the behavioral changes. These changes actually appeared to be an improvement from the attacker's normal behavior. Some of these changes included being more easygoing and tolerant, improving grades, mending relationships, being more positive, being nicer, and other similar changes. On its face, these changes appear to be good, but five offenders from 2016 to 2020 exhibited these changes prior to carrying out their mass attacks. The, part, the Department of Homeland Security noted that most of the offenders in their report showed one of two types of these changes, but 16 showed three to five of these behavior changes within five years of their attacks. The behavioral changes noted above would concern anyone who cares for or is close to the person exhibiting them, but not all would be willing to report the behavior to authorities. 76% of the attackers either showed behavioral changes or shared alarming communications before the attack that caused concern to people around them. The behavior was so extreme in 57% of the offenders that people around them feared for their safety, the attacker's safety, and the safety of others. These concerning behaviors were not reported to anyone with the ability to alter the behavior in 22% of the cases. This statistic is important to show that friends or loved ones who observe these behavioral changes need to reach out to law enforcement and mental health professionals as early as possible to help prevent these attacks. Most times, this behavior was observed by people who were closest to the attacker, classmates, spouses or intimate partners, teachers, family members, or friends. Many times, since they had close ties to the attacker, the observers did not want to report the behaviors to authorities out of sense of loyalty, fear, or disbelief. Leakage occurs when the attacker provides some sort of clue to their state of mind or upcoming attack through a form of communication. Leakage can be very objective or, and specific, or it can be vague and indirect. The indirect linkage is, leakage is difficult because it might cause concern for the attacker, but it does not elicit fear of an imminent threat of harm. Leakage was common among both adults and adolescents, but it is more common among adolescents. 88% of perpetrators 17 years of age or younger leaked information regarding their impending attack, compared to 51% of adults. Communications were made verbally, through written statements or messages, through videos, drawings, or were posted online. 64% of the attackers who engaged in these concerning communications threatened violence. 34% made direct threats toward specific people or groups of people who would later be their targets. Approximately 13 attackers communicated they were going to attack very soon. Unfortunately, for some of these cases, the communication was sent minutes before the offender's attack and nothing could be done to stop it. In other cases, the communications were too vague for officials to take action to prevent the attack. 65% of the attacker's most recent alarming communication occurred within 30 days of the attack, and 37% of the attacker's last communication was on the day of the attack. 30% of perpetrators created legacy tokens. A legacy token is a communication prepared by the offender to claim credit for the attack and articulate the motives 
underlying the shooting. A legacy token can be a video, social media post, manifesto, or any other form of communication created by the attacker and left in an area where it was sure to be found near the time of the attack. Locations for active shooter or mass killing events vary greatly, but most of them occurred in businesses that were open to pedestrian traffic. Businesses in this category include retail, bars, restaurants, offices, banks, gyms, salons, hotels, movie theaters, and shipping and receiving companies. 96 of the 333 active shooter attacks from 2000 to 2019 occurred in these type of businesses. This is not surprising due to the fact that most of these locations are soft targets and invite people to come and go with ease. They usually have minimal security, if any at all, and allow the offender easy access to the business and the targets. According to the FBI, 15% of active shooter events from 2000 to 2019 occurred in areas that were open air locations. As with businesses open to pedestrian traffic, these locations usually have minimal security or easily accessed by the general public. These areas also provide numerous targets for active killers who can either walk amongst them or they can target victims without having to be very close. This is what happened in the 2017 Las Vegas attack. From 2000 to 2019, there were 62 active shooter attacks in educational environments. These shootings occurred in schools ranging from preschool all the way to college campuses. In all, 179 people were killed and 239 were wounded during these attacks. As with the previous two types of locations mentioned, schools are soft targets. The United States Secret Service reports that most common motives for school shootings were grievances with peers, staff, romantic partners, or other grievances. It is therefore logical that schools would be the location these offenders would choose to initiate their attacks. The targets would be easy to find and they would most likely not expect to encounter a deadly force situation in that setting. Along with that, aside from possibly one law enforcement school resource officer, it is likely no one would be able to stop the shooter before they are able to reach their intended targets. Besides the locations listed above, attacks also occurred at various other locations between 2000 and 2019. Some of these included businesses closed to pedestrian traffic, which include warehouses, manufacturing centers, distribution centers, transportation, transportation facilities, offices, malls, government properties, military installations, healthcare facilities, churches, and residents. The National Threat Assessment Center found that 53% of the attackers had no previous affiliation with the location where the attack occurred. These attackers seem to have randomly opened fire at a location of opportunity. 37% of the victims were random. Other attackers apparently chose a location based on what it represented to the attacker or what the location offered as a service. The remaining attackers either chose the location because of their affiliation with it or because their human target or targets were located there. Some of these affiliations were directly related to the attackers. Examples are the attacker was an employee or ex-employee, a client or a customer, a former resident, or a current or former student. Examples of indirect affiliations include the, attacking, the attack taking place at a family member's place of business or at the workplace of an ex-wife. 68% of mass killers did not direct their attacks at specific people. Instead, they chose to victimize random people. Upon reviewing the information, this statistic is less shocking when you consider that most of the random people were targeted because of their race, religion, gender, or ethnicity. This gives credence to the information provided earlier that some active killers are motivated by biases and hatred. Aside from the offenders who chose their victims based on biases or extreme beliefs, 32% of active killers planned their attacks with specific targets in mind. In these cases, personal grievances was a motivating factor behind the attack. These grievances included domestic situations, workplace issues, and other personal issues. The targets in these attacks were current or former romantic partners, current or former coworkers, and family members. Some attackers targeted targeted victims who had an affiliation with these people, such as ex-spouses, uh, current intimate partner, 
divorce attorneys, in-laws, friends, or others with close ties to these people. Some of the nation's most lethal active killer events have occurred in recent years. The advancement of weapon technology has made it possible for these killers to expend more ammunition and inflict more casualties in a very short amount of time. As we will see, the actors in these events vary in age, race, and gender, and their motives are all different. Some of the perpetrators left significant clues about their plans prior to the event, while others didn't show any obvious outward signs of problems. In two of the incidents covered, there were links between the perpetrators and their target locations. The other two studied seemed to be chosen at random as an easy target of opportunity. The chaos these events create for police and how different agencies respond to the events will also be discussed. This section will put the information provided earlier in the presentation into perspective. The first event that we're going to talk about is the 2016 Pulse nightclub shooting. On the night of June 12, 2016 at 2.02 a.m., Omar Mateen entered the Pulse nightclub in Orlando, Florida and opened fire on patrons inside with two semi-automatic weapons. Uh, chaos ensued, uh, obviously, and police officers arrived on scene. Mateen eventually barricaded himself in a bathroom of the club um, with several other victims. He was contained in that location for the remainder of the incident. At 5.15 a.m., um, SWAT team members breached the outer wall uh, to the bathroom where Mateen was um, holding up, and a gunfight ensued. Mateen was shot and killed um, in that gunfight. The results of that attack um, were 49 dead and more than 50 wounded. And talking about Mateen himself, he was a 29-year-old American citizen who was born to Afghan parents in New York. He had been investigated by the FBI two times previously, once in 2013 after he told some co-workers that he had ties to terrorist organizations. And again in 2014, um, after he was linked, after someone that he was linked to became a suicide bomber in Syria. Um, there were no charges filed in either of those investigations and nothing else was done. On June 4th, just days before the shooting, Mateen legally purchased the weapons that he used to carry out the attack on Pulse nightclub. During the attack, Mateen actually communicated to several people um, his intent and pledged allegiance to ISIS. He called the um, Orlando 911 Center and, told, and pledged allegiance to the leader of ISIS. He also called a cable news channel and told the producer that he did it for ISIS. And again, um, during negotiations with the Orlando police negotiator, he told them that um, he was doing it for ISIS as well. The police did a forensic exam of Mateen's electronic devices after the incident, um, but found no evidence that um, ISIS had directed him to carry out the attack, and it was determined that he was a lone wolf, self-radicalized self domestic terrorist. The target of Mateen's attack was a Pulse, the Pulse nightclub in Orlando, Florida. Pulse was an LGBTQ plus bar in Orlando um, that actually catered to people as young as 18 years old. On the night of the shooting, there were approximately 300 people in the club celebrating a Latin night event. The club consisted of three bars, um, a main dance floor and a fenced in area. The club was dark. Uh, it was lit only by strobe lights, and it was very loud because they had multiple DJs playing different music that night. It was so loud, in fact, that some people didn't even realize that shots were being fired um, when the first shots of the attack were, were fired. It wasn't until a DJ um, turned down his music after he heard something odd and realized that the sounds were gunshots and he yelled for people to run. Anybody inside the bar um, that night was a target of Mateen. Um, there was no one specifically that he targeted inside. Um, he targeted the bar and uh, evidence suggests that he just um, decided on that, that club um, just before the event started. 
The weapons that Mateen used in the assault were both semi-automatic. One was a Sig Sauer MCX um, 223 caliber rifle. Um, this is an assault style weapon that has a magazine capable of holding 30 rounds. He also had a handgun, which was a Glock 17 9 millimeter. Uh, this weapon has a magazine capacity of 17 rounds. Both weapons being semi-automatics fire as fast as the shooter can pull the trigger. And so it makes for a deadly combination. The report noted that Mateen um, came in and fired as fast as he could pull the triggers. Um, with that said, Ms. Mateen could have unleashed up to 47 rounds of ammunition in just a matter of seconds before having to change magazines or reload his weapon. Along with those weapons, Mateen also claimed to have um, bombs and vehicles outside as well as um, vest bombs, which no doubt slowed the reaction of the police. Uh, however, after an extensive search, no explosives were found. The police response for this event um, actually happened rather quickly. Uh, however, once Mateen barricaded himself in the bathroom, it, it did slow down. The first officer on scene was actually an off-duty uh, police officer who was working. Uh, his duty for, for that night was to provide security outside of the club and provide any assistance to security personnel inside if needed. At 2.02, the officer heard the gunshots and notified dispatch that shots were being fired and he called for more, more officers to respond. Um, this officer saw the offender shoot two people as they tried to leave the bar. Um, and when he saw these two people shot, he engaged um, the shooter by firing at him. After being shot at, Mateen went further into the club. At 2.05, that officer shot at Mateen for a second time, um, which pushed Mateen deeper into the club. Three other officers responded at the time, uh, or excuse me, arrived at the time at 2.06 a.m. and they immediately formed a team to go in and try to find the shooter. At 2.08, other officers arrived um, from Orlando PD as well as other surrounding jurisdictions and they formed a second contact team. As they were creating that team, the second team, um, the first contact team made entry into the club from the fenced in outdoor area. This team began to rescue victims while the second contact team entered through a broken window and went towards uh, the main dance floor. As the officers were um, helping victims, one of the contact teams heard gunshots coming from one of the other bars. It was called the Adonis Room and they immediately went to that area to engage when they got to that room, they found that the shots were coming from a hallway that was very poorly lit. Um, as soon as they got into that room, the gunshots ended. So the team set up a containment position in the hallway to prevent the shooter from coming back out. The 911 center received a call at 2.10 a.m. from one of the hostages that said that the shooter had barricaded himself in the bathroom. At that point, um, it was decided that this was more of a hostage situation um, because Mateen was barricaded and the SWAT team initiated a full SWAT call out. As the SWAT team was responding, um, officers who were on scene were able to remove victims um, from the area, uh, the injured victims from the area and take them to a triage area. The officers who were there um, did end up transporting some of these injured people to the hospital um, and helped them get them on the am ambulances and um, get them to care. As I mentioned previously, a negotiator was there um, and he negotiated with Mateen for a long time, um, but very little information was provided. Uh, the negotiator kept trying to talk to Mateen because as he stated, if he, if he was talking on the phone, he wasn't shooting. Eventually at 4.33 a.m., um, information was received from Mateen and other officers, or excuse me, other hostages that um, they were afraid that Mateen might shut off some explosive devices 
So the SWAT team decided to um, take action. They punched holes in the west wall of the club um, to try to rescue survivors and locate Mateen. At 5.15 a.m., the, the exterior wall to the restroom was breached. Um, Mateen gauged, engaged officers in a shootout. One of the uh, SWAT officers was actually shot in the head but was saved by his ballistic helmet. Uh, during that shootout, Mateen was killed and the incident was over. The next event we're going to speak about is the 2017 Las Vegas shooting. On October 1st, 2017, at about 10.05 p.m., Stephen Paddock opened fire on the Route 91 Music Festival in Las Vegas, Nevada. Paddock had barricaded himself inside two, two rooms on the 32nd floor of the Mandalay Bay Resort and Casino and was firing down um, thousands of rounds on people attending the festival. Officers received information from security personnel at Mandalay Bay that a shooter was on the 32nd floor. They responded um, to that area and breached one of the rooms to um, make entry. As they entered the room, they found Paddock dead from a self-inflicted gunshot wound to the head and numerous rifles and thousands of rounds of ammunition were in the room. Um, the shooting claimed the lives of 58 people and injured over 700 in just over 10 minutes. This is the deadliest active shooter event in the history of the United States. As mentioned, uh, the offender in this attack was Stephen Paddock. He was a 64 year old white male who owned houses um, in Mesquite and Reno, Nevada. He had a live in girlfriend and no criminal history. People who knew Paddock said he lived a normal life and traveled abroad many times. He was an accountant and worked in real estate. Between 1982 and 2017, Paddock purchased over 84 firearms and firearm accessories to include scopes, bump stocks, and ammunition. Paddock had a live-in girlfriend who said that his demeanor changed over the last year before the attack. He became distant and began to buy uh, more firearms. His girlfriend said that the couple was staying uh, at Mandalay Bay early in September of 2017, and the room that they were in overlooked the Las Vegas Village, which was the venue uh, for the Route 91 Festival. Paddock was um, very interested in the, the view of Las Vegas Village from um, that hotel room. The Paddock's doctor believed that he might have um, bipolar disorder, but Paddock refused to talk to him about that. He didn't. He did not take any medicine for um, depression, but he did take medicine for anxiety. Unfortunately, uh, Paddock did not leave any written documentation to give a reason for this attack, and um, nothing was found subsequently to provide an answer to why he committed these crimes. Officers did find. Um, several indicators of intent, though, um, as they were serving search warrants after the event. They found that Paddock had a hotel reservation reservation in Chicago, Illinois, during the Lollapalooza Music Festival. He actually requested a room that overlooked the venue that held this event. He canceled the reservation days before he was set to arrive. On September 17th of 2017, Paddock checked into the Ogden Condominium Complex with reservations through September 28th. His stay at the Ogden took place during the Life is Musical, or excuse me, Life is Beautiful Music Festival, which took place in an open air venue. He also conducted internet searches of open air concert venues, Las Vegas SWAT tactics and explosives, and of the 84 firearms that he purchased between 1982 and 2017, 55 of them were purchased uh, from October 2016 to September 2017. The target of this attack was the Route 91 Music Festival, which was held at the Las Vegas Village venue. Um, this is an open air venue. It was a three day event uh, with the October 1st being the final day. Over 22,000 people attended on October 1st. At the time of the shooting, it was dark outside and the only light came from street lights, lights from the stage and lights uh, from the perimeter of the venue. 
Inside the perimeter fence was a main stage, vendor tent, seating areas, a medical tent, and a command post. The majority of the venue was open for attendees to watch the performers on the main stage. The layout and the location of Las Vegas Village made it a prime target for Paddock. Thousands of people were confined in a relatively small area, which was clearly visible from the 32nd floor of Mandalay Bay, which is located right across the street. Paddock had an arsenal of weapons um, in the room with him when police searched it after the event. Uh, he had two rooms on the 32nd floor. The rooms were 32-134 and 32-135. When the police searched it after the event, they found 24 firearms. Out of the 24 firearms located, 23 of them were rifles, and the remaining uh, firearm was a revolver that Paddock used to commit suicide. 15 of the rifles um, had either a scope or some sort of optic to make uh, aiming extremely easy. Over half the rifles, uh, 14 of them, were equipped with bump stocks. If you're not familiar with bump stocks, um, this is a device that replaces the traditional stock of a weapon and allows it to be fired at a more rapid rate. It uses the recoil of the weapon to fire multiple shots more quickly. It essentially turns the semi-automatic weapon into a fully automatic weapon. Police also found numerous 25 to 100 round rifle magazines. Some were loaded and some were found empty. There were uh, over a thousand shell uh, empty shell casings found in the room, indicating that he'd shot at least that many rounds into the festival and surrounding area and police found an additional 5,280 rounds of live ammunition in the room uh, after the attack. The police response to this event was actually pretty good. Uh, there were 51 officers working overtime at the festival. Initially, officers working the event thought um, the sounds that they were hearing were fireworks coming from the southwest area of the venue. But um, shortly after these initial shots, officers heard long bursts of automatic gunfire and they began searching the venue for uh, the shooter. In the meantime, there happened to be two officers uh, in the security office of Mandalay Bay dealing with uh, an unrelated call. These officers heard the call of an active shooter at the festival across the street but they also received a report from Mandalay Bay security that shots were being fired in room 32135 uh, at the hotel. These officers and two armed security officers left the security office to go um, investigate this. In the meantime, down in the venue, officers at Las Vegas Village continued to direct attendees toward exits or places of cover. One of the officers working the venue believed the gunfire was actually coming from an elevated position, so he grabbed some binoculars from his vehicle and began scanning the north side of Mandalay Bay. As he was scanning, he observed a silhouette of a man in a shooting position on the upper floors of the building and saw smoke coming from a gun. Back at Mandalay Bay, uh, the officers who were responding to the report of the shots fired uh, reached the 31st floor and heard shots being fired from the floor above them. They proceeded to the 32nd floor and posted up on a door to prevent the shooter from escaping. By this time, there were numerous uh, officers responding to the area um, to assist. Some of the responding officers moved, moved toward cover uh, behind police vehicles um, and they began taking gunfire. Two officers were shot at this time. One was shot in the neck and the other was shot in the bicep. The bullet that hit the officer in the bicep continued through his body and ended up in his chest. As the officers took cover behind the vehicles, they noticed the shots were coming from an elevated position. Officers on the ground began uh, forming strike teams and they went to Mandalay Bay. They coordinated with Mandalay Bay security and other officers to find out where the shooter was located. When they arrived on the 32nd floor, they uh, began entering and searching rooms. Um, at this point, the gunfire had stopped, so uh, this search was very methodical um, to try to get innocent people out of there. 
Eventually, they were able to find um, a door that had been braced shut by Paddock before the attack. Officers breached this door and were able to see the doors to room rooms 32134 and 32135. The doors were shut, and there was a room service cart in front of door 32134. There were wires um, coming from this cart into the room, and the officers believed that there might be some sort of explosive device. They decided to breach the door of 32135 with an explosive breach. When they did that, uh, the door opened and officers could see a rifle laying just inside the door. They called out, but they didn't get any response from the room, so they decided to enter. As they entered the room, they split into two teams and cleared the rooms. This time, uh, Team 2 found Paddock lying on the floor, um, dead from an apparent self-inflicted gunshot wound. No one else was located in the room, but they did find numerous weapons, live ammunition, and um, thousands of spent rounds. That was uh, the conclusion of the Mandalay Bay, Las Vegas shooting. The third incident we're going to talk about is the 2018 Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School shooting in Parkland, Florida. On February 14, 2018, Nicholas Cruz arrived at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School. Um, he gained access to the campus through an unlocked and unmonitored gate, and he went to Building 12, which also had an unlocked and unmonitored front door. Cruz entered uh, the building. Um, and then proceeded to walk around all three floors of the building, fire indis firing indiscriminately into classrooms and down hallways. After shooting 34 people, he left the building and ran across campus where he blended in with other students leaving the school. Luckily, he was located one hour and 16 minutes after the shooting began and was taken into custody. In all, 17 people were killed and 17 were wounded. The offender in this uh, attack, as I mentioned, was Nicholas Cruz. He was a 20, or, excuse me, he was a 19-year-old former student of Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School. Cruz showed violent behavior um, from a very early age, as young as young as three years old, and this behavior occurred regularly throughout his life. There were 69 documented incidences, or excuse me, incidents where Cruz had threatened someone, engaged in violence, talked about guns or weapons, or engaged in other concerning behavior. Although he exhibited this behavior, he'd only committed minor crimes and he'd never been charged with a crime, and he had never been charged with a crime prior to the shooting. Now, he did make some social media posts um, that had him with weapons. There are also pictures of him holding dead animals. In one of the social media posts with him with a weapon, there was a statement that was similar to, I'm going to get this gun when I turn 18 and shoot up the school. One student actually joked with his classmates before the attack that Cruz would become a school shooter after he saw um, a social media post of Cruz um, after he killed a duck with a tire iron and posted it. Cruz made many statements uh, to several people about shooting up the school uh, over the years, but few of these statements were actually reported to law enforcement until after the shooting, and the few that were uh, reported were not acted upon by police. Prior to the shooting, the FBI actually, actually received two tips that were very concerning um, about Cruz's behavior. The first tip was from someone in Mississippi who saw a YouTube video posted by user nicholas.cruz. In this video, the user said, I'm going to be the next school shooter. The tip was not followed up on because the FBI decided there wasn't enough information to identify the person who posted the video. With that said, the FBI also did not serve any legal paperwork to YouTube or Google or anyone else to request any user information on that account. The second tip um, came in on January 5th, 2018 by a friend of the Cruz family. The caller was very concerned about a post made by Cruz and believed that he would follow through on his threats to become a school shooter. 
The caller provided details of Cruz's gun purchases, the dismembering of animals, his temper issues, and all the usernames for his social media platforms. They also provided the FBI with the address and phone number for the family that Cruz was staying with at the time, but the lead was closed as having no value. The target of this attack, as I mentioned, was Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida. The campus consisted of 14 buildings on 45 acres of land. It was a very large campus that included classrooms, storage buildings, admin offices, sports fields and courts, and parking lots. At the time of the shooting, there were over 3,000 students and over 200 staff members on campus. The student entrance um, doors were usually closed, however, they were unlocked and they were unstaffed. There were nine pedestrian great, uh, excuse me, gates to allow entry into the exterior fence of the campus, but these gates were left unopened and unstaffed before school and around 2.15 in the afternoon for st um, to allow students to leave campus. Like I mentioned, Cruz had been a student at the school and likely knew that the gates were left open and unattended. The attack itself occurred in Building 12. Building 12 is a three-story building that had 30 classrooms. At the, on the day of the attack, there were approximately 800 people inside. The exterior doors to the building were metal, but they were unlocked during the day due to the number of students coming and going from the building. Doors to the classrooms themselves could not be locked from the inside and could only be secured with a key on the outside of the door. The classrooms had marked uh, hard corners, which were designated areas that were out of the line of sight from windows in the classroom. Unfortunately, many of these areas were blocked by furniture or were too small to accommodate every student in the room. During the attack, Cruz did not enter any of the classrooms and only shot people he could see uh, from the doors. So the lack of these hard corners likely caused uh, more students to be injured or killed. Cruz did not target specific people in this attack. He stated his intention was to become the next school shooter. Um, his knowledge of the school and its lack of security features allowed him to carry out the, the attack, killing 17 people. There was one security feature of the school that probably saved lives. Um, there were some storm resistant glass uh, in the, on the third floor of the building. Cruz actually uh, took up a sniper position uh, in this room and tried to shoot out, but um, the windows held and he was unable to um, shoot from that position. Unlike um, many of the other offenders that we've talked about, um, Cruz only had one weapon in his attack. Um, but like the other offenders, it was a semi-automatic rifle. His was a Smith & Wesson MP15. His weapon was equipped with a sling and a bipod, and he legally purchased it on February 11th of 2017. After the attack, police recovered eight 30-round and 40-round magazines at the scene. Crews fired approximately 150 rounds during the attack and left an additional 180 um, live rounds at the scene. Cruz had never been charged or convicted of a criminal offense, so he was not a pro he, so he was not prohibited from purchase, purchasing or owning weapons. Although he'd never been convicted, there were numerous warning signs regarding his behavior and his plans. Several of these actions could have resulted in the judicial system getting involved and possibly removing his access to firearms. This failure to, uh, also prevented him from getting court-ordered treatment that could have addressed his behavior prior to, the, prior to the attack. The police response to this event was not good. Um, the first officer on scene was the school resource officer. Uh, he was actually on campus at the time of the shooting. He was in or around building number one when the attack began. Uh, and initially he was told that the, the sounds were fireworks. 
eventually he got into a golf cart and was driven um, by a school staff member to a courtyard near bu Building 12. He was dropped off next to the east doors of Building 12, but he did not approach the doors or look inside of the building. During this time, a staff member um, reported to investigators that he heard five to seven shots coming from Building 12. The SRO advised dispatch that there was possible shots fired on the school campus. He then took shelter at the bottom of a stairwell at Building 7. He remained in this position for the next 48 minutes. The first off-campus officer uh, to respond did not actually come to the school. He blocked traffic on the street next to the school. When he was asked about this, he told investigators that he chose to do this because he knew elementary schools were releasing students. He saw a school bus, so he decided to stop the buses in the area. He did inform um, dispatch that he heard gunshots coming from the football field, um, which caused some confusion uh, for the officers who were still re responding to the scene. Additional officers arrived and they heard gunshots uh, as Cruz was attempting to shoot people on the outside of the building from the third floor. After responding officers arrived, um, several of them, uh, once they got out of their car, re retrieved ballistic vests uh, from the trunks of their cruisers and then um, took cover behind their car for several minutes. Um, by this time, there were other agencies that were, were excuse me, beginning to respond. Um, and everybody who showed up at the scene in those first few minutes um, stated they heard gunshots coming from campus. Uh, Cruz fired his last shots of the attack between um, 237 or excuse me, 227.03 and 227.10. By this time, there were seven Broward County Sheriff's deputies on scene, uh, but none of them had uh, gone to the building where Cruz was at. They continued to wait for more information. At 2.30, officers finally entered Building 12, <clears throat> which is approximately eight minutes after the shooting began, and they began uh, clearing the building. As they were clearing the building, there were some other officers uh, in the school office looking at surveillance footage um, that still showed the, mo the shooter moving around the building. Unfortunately, they didn't realize at the time that that was um, not live footage and this dramatically slowed down the progress of the officers in the building because they thought the shooter was still inside. 33 minutes after the shooting, only about half of Building 12 had been, had been cleared. Uh, at 2.57, officers watching the cameras finally realized that they were watching recorded footage, and they were notified that the um, shooter had left the building and was last seen running toward a basketball court. At 3.09, an officer um, got on the radio, and he advised that the high school baseball coach identified the shooter as Nicholas Cruz. There were deputies at a nearby Walmart and they began asking a bunch of students there if they knew who Cruz was. One of the students in the group told the deputies or gave the deputies Cruz's description and provided additional information from his social media platforms. This information led to police or led police to contact um, the, the family that Cruz had been staying with. Just before 3.40, um, an officer with the Coconut Creek Police Department saw a person matching Cruz's description walking through a neighborhood. Uh, he made contact with the person, found out that it was Cruz, and he was taken into custody at 3.40 p.m. The commission that was um, formed to review this case found several officers did not respond to the active shooter threat adequately, and some of the deputies with Broward County Sheriff's Office took time to don their protective, don their protective gear before going toward the gunshots. The Coral Springs police officers uh, who arrived to help knew what to do in an active shooter situation and they responded immediately to the sounds of gunshots. However, um, conversely, the BCSO deputies did not respond well because they hadn't had training in this matter 
four years. The final case that we're going to go over is the 2023 Nashville Covenant School shooting. On March 27, 2023, Audrey Hale drove to the Covenant School in Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, she had three firearms with her. She got Upon arrival at the school, she got out of her car and shot the glass out of two exterior doors, which gave her access to the building. She then walked through the school and methodically shot anyone that she saw. She went to the second floor of the school and began shooting at responding officers. 14 minutes after the shooting began, uh, Nashville officers um, ran to the sounds of gunfire, located Hale on the second floor, and shot her. She was killed uh, in the shootout. Six people were killed in the attack, including three nine-year-old children. Audrey Hale was a 28-year-old white female who attended Covenant School when she was a child. She identified as a male at the time of the shooting, and she lived with her parents and worked as a graphic designer. She is described as very nice and religious, but in the weeks leading up to the attack, she had posted a lot about depression on her social media platforms. Hale was under the care of a doctor for an emotional disorder, but she had no criminal history. She legally purchased and owned seven firearms. Three of these firearms um, were the ones that she used in the attack. She went to the um, handgun training sessions to become proficient with her weapon. After the attack, um, as police were um, investigating, they found maps of the school, journals, and writings that provided information on her planning for this attack. She also studied the actions of mass murderers, and based on a suicide note left in her bedroom and an abundance of live ammunition left at the scene, it appears that she planned to die uh, during the attack. As I mentioned before, the target of Hale's attack was a Covenant School, which is a Presbyterian Christian school in Nashville, Tennessee. The school has 200 students um, from preschool to sixth grade. And as I mentioned previously, Hale attended the school when she was young. She gained access to the building through by shooting out the glass of two exterior doors. And um, after she entered the building, surveillance footage shows her um, moving freely throughout the school. She is seen opening several unlocked doors looking for victims. Police have stated that there's no evidence that the victims of the attack were specifically targeted, but the school itself was her target. They do have more writings that they found um, during their investigation. However, they have not provided any information on her specific motive for the attack. Hale used three firearms um, during her attack. These included an AR-15, a kel Sub-2000 9mm carbine, and a 9mm Smith & Wesson semi-automatic handgun. She had 30 round magazines for the AR-15 and the carbine. The amount of ammunition she carried indicated that she was prepared to kill as many people as she could, but her killing spree was cut short due to the quick response of the police. In all, Hale fired 152 rounds. All the guns um, that she owned were purchased between October 2020 and June 2022. Her parents didn't think she should own weapons because of her emotional state. However, um, she had no criminal history and was not prevented from legally owning weapons, which we've seen a few times in this presentation. She was not a threat to herself. At least there was no indication that she was a threat to herself or anyone else prior to the attack. So she did not meet the standards to have her weapons taken away under Tennessee's red flag law. Hale's attack on Covenant School lasted approximately 14 minutes. The first call uh, of an active shooter came in at 10.13 a.m. Officers arrived the first officers arrived on scene at 10.24 a.m. Um, this first officer quickly retrieved his patrol rifle from the trunk of his cruiser and then contacted school staff 
um, who provided him with extremely valuable information um, that was as up to date as they could get at the time. Um, these first arriving officers didn't hesitate or wait for more officers to arrive before entering the building. They entered the school and quickly began to search for the killer. Body camera footage from officers on the scene show them clearing uh, rooms as they, as they make their way through the building. They continue to clear the building until they hear gunfire. Um, once they hear the gunfire, they immediately move to the sound uh, of the gunshots, which is the cur uh, current way of responding to these threats. Search team officers communicated with each other so they are aware of everyone's location. This prevents a possible friendly fire situation. It also helps identify if the shots are being fired from the killer or from other officers. As Hale was shooting at officers responding to the school, um, the search team was able to locate her position and form up in a way that would prevent any crossfire. As the officers came into the room where Hale was shooting, um, they were able to identify that she was holding a weapon and was standing in a firing position. They engaged her um, with their own weapons and um, continued shooting until she was dead. This study analyzed case studies and statistical data to analyze active shooter and mass killing events in the United States. The focus was to investigate the backgrounds of attackers, locations of attacks, targets of attacks, weapons used, and police response. The study was done to learn more about why perpetrators chose to carry out a mass killing, why targets were chosen, and the impact the police had during the attack. As stated earlier, it's impossible to come up with a profile for an active killer, but there are almost always clues left by the perpetrator prior to the attack. It's important that people close to the perpetrator or people who observe these signs contact authorities to help prevent the attacks. The locations and people targeted can provide information about the offender's motives. However, it's also important to study the locations to help prevent future attacks. This can come in the form of making the venue more difficult to attack adding security personnel, limiting line of sight, and other ways that might prevent an attack from occurring. Additionally, the way that police respond to an active killer event will have a major impact on the amount of casualties from the attack. Um, as the presentation has shown, quick and immediate response to active killers uh, are vital to ending the threat and limiting the number of casualties. The cases chosen for this presentation uh, were chosen because they all occurred within the last decade, making them recent and relevant. Another reason was to illustrate the differences in the attackers, the venues, and the police response. The first case studied was a 2016 Pulse nightclub attack. This attack garnered public attention because it was an LGBTQ club. Initially, it was thought that the club was targeted because of its clientele. However, the investigation revealed that the attacker chose the club as his target on the night of the attack because it was an easy target. The shooter was a lone wolf attacker inspired by terrorists, by a terrorist organization. He had been investigated by the FBI two different times. Uh, however, he was never arrested or charged with any events, or excuse me, with any crimes. Uh, the police response to this attack was unique from many other active killer events uh, that have occurred. The event started as an active shooter response. The initial officer who was at the scene engaged the target immediately and the first responding officers immediately went into the club to try to locate and neutralize the shooter. However, uh, the perpetrator was able to 
barricade himself in a bathroom and with hostages. When this occurred, the scene changed from an active shooter response to a barricaded armed suspect with hostages. At that point, the SWAT team took over control of the scene and executed their mission as they would with any other barricaded subject. Officers on the scene held the perimeter and helped triage and remove wounded individuals while the SWAT team tried to negotiate with the shooter. Um, however, ultimately a gunfight ensued and he was killed. The second case studied was the 2017 Las Vegas Route 91 Harvest Festival shooting. This is the most lethal active killer event in U.S. history, which is one reason the case was studied. The shooter was armed with a stockpile of weapons equipped with optics and bump stocks, which allowed the semi-automatic weapons to fire more rapidly. Uh, he opened fire on an open-air venue from an elevated position. Over 22,000 people attended the concert on the day of the attack. The shooter had no criminal history and had legally purchased all of his weapons over the years. Police were unable to find a motive for the attack during the investigation. The shooter did not leave any sort of correspondence or manifesto or anything to indicate why he attacked the concert. When the first shots were fired, many people, including the police officers on the scene, thought the shots were coming from inside the venue. Luckily, there were two Las Vegas Metro police officers who happened to be at the Mandalay Bay on an unrelated call when they were told that someone was shooting from the second, 32nd floor of the hotel. At the same time, there was an off-duty officer working the venue um, who thought the shots were coming from an elevated position. As he scanned the hotel, he observed a, someone standing in a shooting stance and smoke coming from uh, the hotel. Police officers responded very quickly to the 32nd floor, and by the time they got to that location, the shooting had stopped, and they methodically then began clearing rooms of the hotel as no shots were being fired. When they breached the door to the room, they found the shooter had committed suicide um, before he could be confronted by the police. The third case studied for this presentation was the 2018 Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School shooting. This case was chosen for a couple of reasons. First, there were many missed opportunities to prevent this attack. The shooter, a former student at the school, had a history of violent behavior. He told people and made social media posts that he was going to be the next school shooter. Prior to the shooting, the FBI received two tips that could have led to an intervention. Neither of these tips were properly investigated. There were many other indicators and information that could have led authorities to remove the, the shooter's weapons and possibly get him help that could have prevented the attack. However, nothing was done. Another factor in choosing this case was the police response. In short, it was ineffective. The school had a school resource officer on campus at the time of the shooting. This officer failed to respond to the threat and was found hiding under the, some stairs after the shooting. Additionally, Many other responding officers did not go to the sound of gunfire, but instead took time to retrieve body armor and then took cover behind their cruisers, never going to stop the threat. Communication issues were also a problem. Different agencies responded and they were unable to communicate with each other. There was also incorrect information, information being transmitted by people on scene, which only made the chaotic situation more confusing. The venue itself was a large school with 14 buildings. The attack took place in building number 12, which was left unlocked on, unlocked on the day of the attack. None of the classroom doors were locked at the time of the attack. However, um, the shooter did not enter any rooms. He shot through the doors um, and windows of the building. Um, the shooter was able to escape the scene by blending in with fleeing students and was apprehended a little over an hour after the last shots were fired.
The final case studied was the 2023 Nashville Covenant school shooting. This case was chosen because it was very recent and the police response was an example of current best practices when responding to an active killer event. The shooter had no criminal history and legally purchased the weapons used in the attack. She regularly trained with the weapons that she used. She was a former student at the school and knew the layout. The school was locked at the time of the attack. However, the shooter gained access by shooting out the glass in the doors. And once inside, she was able to move around freely, shooting victims of opportunity. The police response to this event was excellent. The first responding officers arrived at the school at 1024 AM. The initial officers quickly formed teams and began routinely and methodically clearing the school as they searched for the shooter. As they were searching, gunshots rang out and they immediately responded to the sound of the gunshots. They arrived where the shooter was located and eliminated the threat just three minutes after their arrival. Data collected in this study correlates with previously collected data on the active killer phenomenon in the United States. The information reiterates information obtained in the literature review. A few specific statistics stated in the literature review are brought to the forefront in this study. First, active killer's motives vary. The Pulse nightclub attacker was motivated by extremist beliefs, while the Las Vegas, sh Las Vegas shooter's motives remain unclear to this day. Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School shooter displayed a propensity for violence all his life, and his goal was to become the next school shooter. Another statistic revealed in the literature review is that most active killers are male, but there have been female attackers. The shooter in the Covenant school shooting in Nashville was a female. Information obtained in the lit review stated that there is usually a link between the attacker and the target location. This was a case in two of the shootings studied. Cruz and Hale were both former students at the schools they attacked. Additionally, some targets are chosen to create the largest death count as possible. This appears to be why Paddock chose the, to attack the Route 91 Music Festival from an elevated position. One variation from the literature review was that handguns were used in 67% of the attacks from 2000 to 2019. In the cases studied, semi-automatic rifles were the weapons of choice. Mateen and Hale used handguns in their attacks, but Paddock and crews only used rifles. 58% of attackers from 2016 to 2020 showed symptoms of mental health issues prior to or at the time of their attacks. Three of the four attackers studied in this report showed signs of mental health issues. The only, only perpetrator who didn't present evidence of mental health issues was Mateen, who was motivated by extremism. All four perpetrators in this study legally purchased their firearms before the attack. 76% of active killers either showed behavioral changes or shared, shared alarming communications before the attack that caused concern to people around them. All the offenders in this study displayed some type of warning signs or leakages before their attacks. Mateen had been investigated by the FBI for possible links to terrorism. He told people he was watching jihadist videos and that he had ties to a terrorist organization and he was linked to a suicide bomber in Syria. However, the FBI closed these cases without arresting him. Paddock's girlfriend told investigators he had become distant and began buying more firearms in the year leading up to the attack. Cruz had a history of violent behavior and made many statements and social media posts about becoming a school shooter. The FBI received two tips from people concerned by Cruz's behavior, but no follow-up was done and the cases were closed without any investigation. Hale left a plethora of information behind detailing her plan to attack the Covenant School, but none of this information was found until after her attack. She also sent a suicidal message to a friend right before she carried out her attack. Her friend called the police, but the attack was over before she was able to speak with anyone. This study was greatly limited by the number of cases researched. According to the FBI, from 2000 to 2019, there were 333 active killer events that resulted in 2,851 casualties. This study covered four of these events, which is only 1.2% of all events listed by the FBI. Another limitation to the study is that two of the events researched were school shootings. As covered in the literature review, school shootings only account for a little more than 18% of active killer events during that 20-year time frame. 
A thorough investigation of a larger number of these events would be beneficial for future research to get more relevant data on the topic. As we conclude this, there are a few points that we should take away from it. As I mentioned in the introduction, there is no exact profile for perpetrators of active killer events. And I think this presentation kind of drives that home. The offenders in these events ranged in age from 19 to 64 years old. And although a majority of active killers uh, are male, one of the attackers covered here was a female. Every one of the shooters reviewed showed warning signs prior to their attacks. Some of these warnings were very obvious and others were more subtle. Mateen was investigated by the FBI on different occasions prior to his attack, but those cases were closed with no action taken. In the case of Cruz, different people reported his behavior to authorities, but no one took the time to follow up on any of these complaints. None of the offenders that we learned about today studied or had a criminal history serious enough to prevent them from purchasing or owning firearms, and they all were e legally able to purchase the weapons that would later be used in their attacks. The targets um, that we covered today also show that it's not easy to predict where an active killer event may occur. Two of the targets, the high schools were, or excuse me, the schools were clearly targeted by former students, and the other two seemed to be chosen at random due to their easy access to targets. These randomly chosen targets um, show how difficult it can be to prevent a mass attack if the perpetrator is resolute in their plan. Schools do have the ability to make themselves a harder target if safety protocols are in place and if they are enforced. The attack on Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School would have been much more difficult to execute if the gates on the exterior of the campus and the doors to the buildings were locked and monitored. The offenders in these cases um, used at least one semi-automatic semi rifle in their attacks, and all of the weapons, like I said before, were legally purchased. Modern technology allows the perpetrators to discharge large volumes of ammunition that increase the lethality of these events. The attacker in the Las Vegas shooting had his weapon equipped with optics to help him accurately hit targets from long range. He also had bump stocks on many of his weapons that increased the rate of fire to inflict more carnage during the attack. Along with that, all the attackers carried large amounts of ammunition, which made clear their intent to inflict mass casualties at their chosen locations. This report also highlights the importance of police response to active killer events. Law enforcement has had to adapt and change their response to these events to limit the loss of innocent lives. Of the three of the four events that we reviewed in this uh, presentation show how a quick and decisive response can limit the loss of life. In Orlando, Las Vegas, and Nashville, the first officers to respond to the scene decided to go look for the shooters immediately. This response in Orlando led to the offender barricading himself in a bathroom and likely limited the number of casualties by removing him from the rest of the club. In Las Vegas, the decisive response allowed officers to locate the shooter and get close enough to him that he committed suicide, ending the attack. Although that attack was incredibly deadly, the worst in American history, it would have been much worse if the police response was slower. And the response in Nashville was a perfect example of how law enforcement should respond to these attacks. The officers immediately entered the building and began clearing rooms. They responded to the sounds of gunfire quickly and they eliminated the threat. Conversely, the pol police response in Parkland likely resulted in a higher number of casualties. These events do not allow for officers to take cover, hold position, and wait for backup like we saw in Parkland. Many of the first officers to arrive heard gunshots, but no one went to look for the shooter. These scenes are extremely chaotic and stressful but that does not alleviate law enforcement from the responsibility of protecting innocent lives. It's impossible to prevent all active killer events. However, it is possible to interdict some of these events. There are two ways these events can be limited. One way to limit the lethality in these attacks has been covered, and that's for a quick and decisive police response. Another is thorough threat assessment. We have seen that warning signs are rarely shared with authorities. However, if they do receive warning signs from a member of the public, they should be diligent in investigating that information. 
These investigations should be thorough to ensure that they are finding all available information to help make decisions that could save lives. If the information is corroborated, it may be possible to get potential attackers court-ordered mental health treatment and or remove their access to weapons.